I almost quiver with humor, so to speak, on what I'm about to share because it's kind of interesting. It's like a funny thing happened to me on the way of being wrong. I was right. <laughs> there is that joke that my wife and I have. We, we go back and forth about different things and when I first got together with my wife, she wasn't a Christian. You know, she got saved and, you know, we gradually, you know, she got, well, first she got saved and then I told her that I didn't want her living in my shadow and I didn't want to make a disciple of her because, you know, some men do, you know, they want their wives to be disciples of themselves, you know. And now me, man, <laughs> I wanted God to inspire her and to teach her and to lead her and to instruct her in the way that she should go that I was so adamant about that that she wound up becoming her own individual relationship with Jesus and, you know, personal and felt it and grown and, you know, it has maybe some overtures of mine, you know, in different ways that I've kind of instructed little things, you know, tried to help her along the way, but for the most part, you know, she's grown on her own, you know, with the Lord, the Holy Spirit guiding her and abiding with her. Now, having said that, <laughs> of course, when you're an older Christian, you know, to a younger Christian, you know, sometimes you look like something you're not. And I like to say, I'm not always right, but I'm not always wrong. And sometimes the beauty of what God can do is that He can take you when you're wrong and make you right. Now, that's kind of a confusing thing to some people, you see, because there are times and places and purposes and designs that God has. Whatever they are, you know, it's His business. He does it according to His will, His choice, His direction. He will operate according to His own sovereignty. And so, a lot of times, we get these obscure Christian statements that come out of nowhere and you go, huh, I didn't know that was in the Bible. You know, like, who can make straight that which he has made crooked? And then, you know, you get all these wonderful tr people trying to explain, you know, well, you know, how, how do we define that one? Or, you know, who made evil, you know? And why do good things happen to bad people? Or why do bad things happen to good people? To me, why bad things happen to good people is so simple that, you know, I just, I think that's the dumbest question I've ever heard answered in all the weirdest ways I've ever seen possible. But, <laughs> okay, you know, they just don't get it, but that's all right, you know. They can go ask God on their own. But, and you know, they, or you could see my tape on it, or maybe my tape series if I have to make one. <laughs> I could just see video doctrine, you know, talking about why do bad things happen to good people, you know, 60 tapes long. <laughs> That's just a dumb statement to me. I just, you know, even logically, I come up with answers that are simple to me, but, you know, who knows? Maybe someday I'll make a video about that. Again, I think I've done that a few times. But my point is, with my wife and I, we used to joke about this, you know. We'd write down on the calendar when she was right, and we'd write down on the calendar when I was, you know, wrong because I was never wrong. <laughs> At least it's not as far as she was concerned because you see, the discussion we were having when she was just young in the faith or just becoming a Christian was she was always asking things about what was going on in her life or dealing with things that God was doing with her. You know, and so she would ask something about a scripture and I'd, I'd just pop in my head, pop off with whatever you know, the Lord inspired me with and, she would think it was wrong, and she'd go look it up, and turn out to be right. <laughs> it wasn't like I memorized the scripture. It was just like you know, God wanted me to be a source point, not to be always right, because I'm not, and she knows that too now. But at one point in time, when it came to making decisions or making a demonstration of how our relationship, hers and eyes, would be, then God would make me right in every circumstance or situation, so that. He could demonstrate to her to trust in Him because I would show her, look, we're not sitting down and praying for my will to be done because I can tell you what I want, but I want to sit down and pray with you so that we find out what God wants. And I would do that in every situation. And it became frustrating to her, you know, because that's what usually happens with most Christians when they start off. They want what they want when they want it, and they want to get quick answers, you know, rather than find out what God wants for them at that time in their life. And the older Christians get, you know, because I've been a Christian for almost 40 years now, 
the older you get, you get out of your terrible twos and your, you know, experimental twenties or whatever, you know. And finally, down the road, you become a sage. You're not kidding. <laughs> you become a sage with all the answers. You know, no, not really. But you, you know, you've got some life experiences, and you've got some. I like to say faith experiences. Hopefully, you know, if you've grown during those years that you've been a Christian. If you haven't grown, you might be still sticking your thumb in your mouth, you know, and whining and complaining and, you know, sticking your fingers in your ears and your thumb in your mouth. You know, kind of, you know, one of those things where you don't hear God and you don't talk to God and you don't have any real knowledge of God. <laughs> uh, it's kind of sad if you've been around for a while. God's not deaf and dumb and he's not mute. <laughs> Sorry, maybe for you, you have that problem and it's not God's problem, but yours. But for my wife, it was a whole different story. We had this joke running, you know, that was you know, being wrong or being right. And that's what God does with pastors too, lots of times. The pastor could be wrong, don't get me wrong. I mean, he could be in error, but in some ways God will make him right so that you'll learn to be obedient to him if God wants to use that circumstance in your life. Because you see, it's not every time that a pastor's wrong, God could make him right. It's not every time that you know my wife and I got together that I was always right and she was wrong. It was only the times when God was using it as a teaching tool or a methodology to reveal something about the heart of the person and the real issues that were being done. It wasn't about a pastor being right or a parishioner being wrong or a person that's sitting in that teaching or underneath that church or whatever it may be. But sometimes a person who's in rebellion to authority, all authority, God's too, will challenge a pastor or challenge a teaching or challenge a person and come at them with anger, with wrath, you know, with this righteous and self-righteous attitude because they're dealing with something inside that has nothing to do with the circumstances of challenging whether a pastor's right. But God will make that person right, the pastor in order to reveal the heart of the person who's got anger and wrath and all that kind of junk, junk you know, that's venting outward by his own actions and his attitudes of why he's doing what he's doing. And that's the key issue there, is that God wants to deal with your attitude. If your attitude's wrong, believe me, he will make you wrong even though you may be right. And I know that's kind of like you going, huh? What do you mean? Well, you see, when we are in God, we're covered. When we're outside of God, we're not covered. It's kind of like walking under an umbrella. If you're out from under the umbrella, hey, you're not covered. If you're under the umbrella, you're covered. You know, it's kind of like being rained on. If you really want to walk out in the rain without an umbrella, go ahead. You're going to get rained on. But if you've got an umbrella, you're covered. God does the same thing when he uses the words in the Bible when it says, if any man be in Christ, if any man be in Jesus, if any man have the Spirit of God in them. In other words, God is in us and God covers us like a mother chick covers his hens and protects us and guides us. But if we step outside of what God wants us to do or we go against what God tells us to do, we're kind of like stepping outside and kind of like moving away from God, kind of distancing ourselves, you know, like sin does moving farther away and farther away until we can hardly hear what he has to say. I mean, not like he is far away, because he's not. He's always here. He's always inside you. But you have moved. It says your sins have separated you from God. And that's usually what the issue is when he makes someone right, even though they may be wrong. And that's kind of weird yeah, thought, isn't it? Doesn't that sound wrong? <laughs> Or right? <laughs> you figure that one out. So it's not a what some Christians call a circumstantial application of theological proofs, but rather it's a, <laughs> as we get into these theological terms, it's rather a dispensation of God revealing His will in accordance to the ministrations of the Holy Spirit doing several as He wills the choices He makes in revealing things that you can sit down and always examine the facts and still see that they fit according to Scripture. I mean, that's not a problem. But when a pastor is put in charge, 
you'll see that a lot of times people will come up with this kind of authority problem, this authority issue. They'll always wrestle with this kind of like spiritual, physical, pride, ego kind of relationship. And so they wrestle with this idea of right, wrong, and you know, who's in charge. The same way that some marriages do. You know, they always want to do a right versus wrong versus who's in charge, ego versus yid versus, you know, the male ego versus female ego versus women's you know ministrations versus men's ministrations are you in touch with your feminine side or are you in touch with your male side you know god working in both to accomplish his will you know i simply tell people hey look you know it's like a triangle you know and you're at one end of the triangle and the other person at the other end of the triangle the closer you get to god the closer you get to each other otherwise guess what you really are in conflict when you're looking at each other and that's what we should not be doing when we look towards anyone we should be looking to God, through God, at another person. That's my simple you know, definition of relationships. But in that humorous part where we don't do that, and most of us don't, we play games with each other. You know, we tease each other about being right or wrong. You know, it's like, hey, honey, check it out, man. I'm right again. Ah, God got the glory. Ah, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, and we do that. You know, what up? It's just... only when you take that and put it out into the world, it really demonstrates a failure on our part to acknowledge that we have no real wisdom of ourselves. We're not so smart. We're not the ones that's always right. As a matter of fact, the humorous thing that I got out of this entire teaching and you know, ministration of God working in my life, you know, especially in the ministry of Vidivo, was this, was that you know, pastors, I've heard them say, because I've been to pastors' conferences and stuff, you know, like Calvary chapels, whatever, but anyways, pastors will say this. You know, they'll, somebody will ask them and they'll say, you know, do you ever listen to your own tape? No. Nah. Do you ever watch your own video? Oh, no. You know, no. And, you know, me, you ask me, oh, yeah. You betcha. <laughs> you 100%. <laughs> of course. you got to believe that I listen to these videos and I watch them because you know what? I'm as shocked as you are that I'm right <laughs> about anything. <laughs> as a matter of fact, nine times out of ten, I'll sit down and watch a video and wonder, who the heck was teaching that? And I'm looking at me. Because <laughs> you know what? I'm blown away. I'm going, man, I wish I could find a pastor like that. <gasps> Not me. Oh, back off, Jack. <laughs> but the point being is that I know, you know, sharing and relating, you know, personally, my relationship with God, who I am. So I know when God is speaking, <laughs> when I'm speaking, ain't no problem there. <laughs> if it's wrong, it was me. If it's right, it was him. You know, that's pretty simple for me. And some people say, well, you know, that's a platitude or, you know, some kind of like, you know, superlative in order to cover some kind of like, you know, egotistical, self, you know, righteous perspective. And I'm like, uh, you ain't been around me very long. <laughs> no, because out of this mouth can come blessing and curse. I already know that. <laughs> Just ask my wife. You know, it doesn't take a genius to hang around with me very long. But you see, when I'm talking about God, when I'm relating Jesus, when I'm filled with that love that I have for him, oh, even my wife is blown away because she can see the difference. It's like night and day between who I am in the Lord and who I am in the flesh. You see, who I am in the Spirit of God is different than who I am in the Word of God as opposed to who I am in my own carnal flesh. But I don't yield myself to being carnal as much as maybe some do because I've been around a while. I kind of don't like the guy that I am that I see sometimes you know, in the mirror. So I try to yield myself or do more that involves God in me than I do involving me in me. Oh, I work, you know. My wife says, you know, you can be a real bastard at times. Well, you know, if I have to tell somebody at work, no. You know, when I was working, they knew no meant no. <laughs> I mean, it was like cut and dry. Now, there are things that she says is beneficial to her that I've helped her with her in her vocations, and there are things that she says, you know, we could have used a little more Lord in. <laughs> You know, it's like, it depends on what the situation and the circumstances are. The same way that the Holy Spirit uses the circumstances of your life in the same way he uses you. You may be, at some moment in time, a saint. At least for a little while. 
And then at some point in time, you may be a sinner. You know, at least for a little while. And at some point in time, you may realize that grace is what covers it all. And so the realization of who we are isn't about being right always or being wrong always. Because I'm not right always. But it's not any more prideful to say, yes, I want to watch a video, you know, with you and see it and go, yeah, that guy's a kook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This guy, you know, and I'm going, man, that's trippy, you know, he's, that's a, yeah, he's a character, you know, like, uh, yeah, I kind of like it, you know, like, wish I'd be like that. <laughs> and it's me. It's like, when did that happen? Wow, could have had a V8. And you know, that's the thing that some pastors fail to admit, either because of their ego or because of their realizations that they are more programming their topic of discussion than inspiration of God being able to take their personality and use it in the way he chooses to reveal himself as opposed to reveal themselves. Because anyone, and I'll be straight, straight up with you, any idiot and magpie can sit down and write a beautiful sermon. And that is not a hard thing. You know, they can do a dissertation of an exegetical study based upon, you know, if we're talking Calvary Chapels, a Calvary Chapel model. Or maybe a sermon based upon a Spurgeon model. Or a dissertation based upon a I'm trying to think of what that guy's name is. Um, I can see his, see him right now in my mind. He's got like this, you know, glasses and heavy face kind of look thing, and he was a great person that seemed to give lots of exhortation. Or let's pick a different one. Or he could be a hellfire and brimstone like a Billy Sunday, you know, module. Anybody can sit down and write one of those. I mean, really, you know, you get you get a couple of them next to you, you know, and you kind of program it out, and then you just put together, you know, kind of thing, and you. Swap pieces, you know, and you got, there you go. Cut and paste, you know. <laughs> Repost. Well, what do we call it in Facebook nowadays? Oh. Like it. <laughs> it's like. Put your name on it. Like it. But really, anybody can do that. Anybody. I mean, that's why there's so much, you know, out there of material that's really sometimes not real material from the heart. It's not the person. It's the theological ideas, it's a religious dogma, it's doctrines, it's just gurgitating what they have ingested in order to present a format with which, yeah, you know, you know, God depending, you know, can do what he wants with it, but it isn't really what Jesus said, because you know, Jesus was talking to his disciples because they weren't the, they weren't exactly you know the greatest geniuses in the world. Some of them were, you know. John was, had some pharisaical background, you know. But you know, Peter wasn't exactly you know Mister, you know, walk and talk. You know, we're not kind of a slur slam damn you know kind of fisherman kind of guy. The guy got drunk, you know. I'm sorry, you know, this might destroy somebody's image, but a fisherman from Galilee drank and got drunk. And there may have been a time in the scriptures where we could point together and say, yeah, that was Peter, and he was drunk. <laughs> uh, you know. Jesus of Nazareth came up with a very good scene about that, you know, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, that was, you know, the idea behind it, you know, and it was very poignant for the times and the place for the accuracy. Even though that may shock some people. But they were Jewish fishermen, come on, let's get real. Uh, wine. <laughs> you know, marriage supper, hey. Make some more. <laughs> Jesus did. But my point is, a lot of times, people will extend their own interpretation on top of what God's inspiration is, rather than let God inspire, like Jesus said, we should all do. That we should not think about what we're going to say ahead of time. But we should let God speak through us at the moment that we are brought before kings and priests or flocks. <laughs> I had to come up with something. The chapel, you know, I started to say chapel people. You know, it's like, no, they're not chapel people. They're flocks. They're pew, pew sitters in front of people. You know, anywhere we go, whatever it is. You know, we should be just yielded. You know, just like, hey, you know, I don't know what I'm going to say. Who knows what will come out of my mouth? That's what I tell my wife. And she goes, yeah, I know. 
God help us, you know. <laughs> Exorcism. <laughs> no, not Catholic. But my point is, if we are yielded, if we are letting God speak, if we are really so anointed or appointed by God to be used by Him to accomplish His will, then we might sit down like if you were recording a video and you might do it yourself, you know, maybe you should try it. And you'll record something and you'll go, wow, that's awesome. You know, and you'll realize at first, maybe when you're young, you'll, you'll be tempted to say, man, I'm smart. <laughs> you know, okay. Okay. <laughs> you know, we won't even go there and talk about that. But the humorous part is that when you do that, then you know that it's that fulfillment of the scripture that says, it's no longer I that liveth but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the will of the Son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. In other words, it's no longer me, but it's he. So it's we, not me. You get it? You know, I used to say it this way. Maybe I still do sometimes when I kind of revert back to my old Jesus Street days. But I used to say things like, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, it's like I'm taking a backseat in my mind and watching what's coming out of my mouth and I feel like I'm sitting four inches behind my eyes because it's kind of like I'm a little bit distant back, you know, but then I realize that, you know, there might be some mental health expert out there thinking, oh, that's schizophrenia, you know, and I went, well, you know, I used to teach a tape series I called Schizophrenic Christians, you know, but anyways, they may think something, so I just decided to quit saying that it was four inches behind my eyes I'm sitting back there in the back of my mind, you know, going, oh, wow, praise the Lord, look at what God's doing. You know, but you get it, right? You know, the scripture, you know, how it fits, you know, God in you, and that there, this really is God in you, and that it's no longer you, but, you know, may have a flavoring of you on it, but, you know, it's really God speaking. That's what Jesus wanted us to do. He didn't want us to be more of ourselves or to make up some kind of like, you know, way of doing it, you know. You know, like, ah. You know, and make it ourselves, you know, portraying like a magpie his word. But rather, he wanted it to be unique coming from the vessel he uses. And it would still be his word, his inspiration, his direction, his way of revelation of who he is inside of you, inside of me. And that's where I get blessed. Because I find that inside of me, God is alive. I find inside of you, God is real. I find that in my life, as well as in yours, I'm seeing every day you and I change into the image of His Son as we are getting to know each other more rather than finding fault with each other to a greater degree. As a matter of fact, I see that in the long term, I find less at fault with you than I find about you. And I find less to be fault-finding than I am to find more to build up on. And that's kind of like what I've done with my wife. I see so much beauty and joy in her life now as she's grown in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as she's developed her personal relationship with Him, as she has come into a fullness of understanding who God is and how He's dealing in her life. She has become a new creation that I am rejoicing and seeing as I watch God revealed in her. God blesses his children for holy intentions. Jesus answered, Hey, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me. John 8.54 Them that honor me, I will honor said God once to a priest of Israel, and the ancient law of the kingdom stands today unchanged by the passing of time or the changes of dispensation. The whole Bible and every page of history proclaims the perpetuation of that law. If any man serve me, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. And so said our Lord Jesus, tying in the old with the new and revealing the essential unity of his ways with man. It seems plain that almost any Bible character who honestly tried to glorify God in his earthly walk was so honored. See how God overlooked weaknesses and failures as he poured upon his servants grace and blessing? Let it be Abraham. Take a look at him. He's not perfect. Or Jacob. 
<laughs> obviously, or David, or Daniel, or Elijah, or whom you will, no matter who they are. The honor followed honor as harvest the seed. God honored them for what they did as they served him. The man of God sets his heart to exalt God above all, even above himself, knowing that he is not the tool that is creating, but rather he is being used by God as a tool. God accepted his intention as fact and acted accordingly. Not perfection, but holy intention made the difference. What the intent was, was more important than the content of what the person actually was. Every one of those men, their content of their lives was pretty messed up. But the intent of what their heart was, was completely different. They chose to serve the Lord. In our Lord Jesus Christ, this law has seen in simple perfection. He sought not his own honor, but the honor of the God who sent him. If I honor myself, he said on one occasion, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me. So far had the proud Pharisees departed from this law that they could not understand one who honored God at his own expense. I even told my wife one time, I said, you know, honey, I said, I'm only trying to show you Jesus. And that's why God makes me right. I said, if I was trying to do something else, God would make me wrong. And that's bottom line. But I'm not trying to bring you into a place of knowing me as though I'm somebody smart or really intelligent or super wise or you know, great Christian. I'm trying to get you to decide who Jesus is and know him better than you know me. I want you to discover God in a more intimate way than I know him. Because I fully expect you to speak to me someday with the inspiration that God has given you and I would be hearing the voice of God coming out of you and I would be blessed and instructed encouraged exhorted even maybe chastised so my greatest joy has always been for the day that I would hear my wife say to me things that God speaks to me and so I'm thrilled with the idea that we should not be so consumed with worrying about who really is in charge when some man of God speaks something because really he's not in charge you know it's like there are a lot of people that are arguing about well you know that guy's got an ego trip blah 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 who cares you know when he does speak if he's speaking of the oracles of God you know as the Bible says it's oracles then let's examine that part and see if it fits for us because I'm sure that that man of God and that man with God may not be perfect in his content of his life but the intent of his heart is still the same as any man that stands before the congregation and seeks to choose to use that which the Holy Spirit has given them. And that is to reveal Jesus in some way to you, to me. And so I tend to want to, I don't always do, but I tend to want to give them the honor and glory that God bestows upon them according to his sovereignty as he says, hey, no man can do what they do except they receive it from my Father in heaven. So if they're not against me, Jesus said, they're for me. So don't stop them from doing what they're doing. Rather, encourage them to keep going. Because even when they're wrong, you hear it coming, God could make them right. The question is, do we trust him to do that? And are we willing to let God make and reveal what is wrong and let God reveal and make what is right. I know for me, it's what I do.